gentlemen, you are both drunk on cosmic wine. Welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Mark Sylvester. And I'm Dr. Richard Schulman. This, this is, is All Psych. Psych. Well, thanks for joining us again for part two of Archaeological Mysteries. Rich, can you kick us off? With the I, I love Archaeological Mysteries, but we're going to start with the mental wealth tip of the day. Here's, here it comes. Drum roll, please. In our present day, we live in a touch-starved, touch-phobic society. Touch creates a dramatic emotional connection with another person. It could be good, positive touch or violent, negative touch, but it's always going to be important. And especially since the pandemic, where we have to keep six feet away from each other, even though they just that was just an arbitrary number, um, we're even more touch starved and touch phobic. Something to remember. So we need to get back into touching each other. I do. I do think so. I, I mean, you know, hugging, hold, you know, holding hand, not shaking hand. This is insanity. Yeah, and the people who have suffered the most are the ones that didn't know they may be the type that need it the most. Usually that's true, but I think kids. kids I, I, think kid, sure. I think kids have suffered the most in the pandemic. Kids were the last ones to have mask mandates removed. You know, schools being open were the last things to, to be open. I mean, we pay a lot of lip service in this society to loving our kids. It's clear to me that we don't give a rat's ass about our kids. And maybe that's a bigger mental wealth tip, you know, that maybe care about your kids and my kids. Well, if I had grandkids, it'd be my grandkids. But um, the children, children are the ones who are hurt the most in this touch starved, touch phobic society. Especially during those critical developmental years. Really, it, it's incredible because you know, this goes beyond the mental wealth tip, I guess, but in that famous experiment, Harlow's Monkeys, where they had the, uh, the wire monkey giving the, the baby monkeys milk or the, or the um, plush, you know, comfy monkey doing it. And the, the baby monkeys who could get comfort showed normal development, whereas the ones that got the milk from the wire monkey um, did not. And one of my professors in grad school was a grad student on that experiment, and it's real. So hmm. that's our mental wealth tip of the day. Well, thank you. Let's dive into the mysteries. And we go yeah. from being touch starved and touch phobic to touching the mysteries of archaeology. Of the universe. No, I think we covered about 10 of them last time and want to cover about 10 more today okay these are these are our favorites some that we picked but why don't we start with the uh king tut's death and tomb oh wait 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 before we start let's get an audio visual get old king let's get tut out to say hi yes hi. i don't know if that i don't know if that's him but that is him artist representation of king tut i yeah. found it in the tomb the artist formerly known as King Tut. <laughs> but, you know, people have always been fascinated with Egyptology and, and a lot of the mythology uh, of the people of the time and how we understand them. So there was much excitement about this one, this mysterious mummy um, of this, this king boy, really, an Egyptian boy, Pharaoh uh, Tutankhamun. And what was interesting is it sat there undisturbed for thousands and thousands of years. Matter of fact, it wasn't even discovered until the 20th century by a British uh, Egyptologist, Howard uh, Carter. Um, and one thing, and this was in 1922, and one thing that they started to know, notice, I guess, were the uh, odd occurrences that were taking place since the discovery. Uh, basically, anyone who was investigating would have some perceived curse put over them 
Um, and some believe that it was a type of a magical protection to ensure that that, that his, you know, um, his body was left and his tomb was left undisturbed. But it became a big deal and that all the people that worked on this had some what they would contribute to be a curse or a series of bad events, um, oftentimes killing those who came near the tomb. Um, although I think it could be an urgent or urban legend, but some say it all comes out of a uh, little bit of truth comes out of these mysteries. What do you think? Well, you know, I, I tend to go pretty far down the rabbit hole. And I think that if they're, okay, I didn't expect to, to answer this question, but I will. I believe that there is something called torsion fields, emotional fields that are, that are in a space. It's why I clear my office periodically. Because if somebody's angry in a room, then they leave the room. I think you can still feel some of that. So if there were people putting these energies, emotions into that space, you know, you, you get all the way down the rabbit hole. There is no time and space at that point, And you can encounter these energies. I don't know if that's how, you know, spells really work. But um, I think it's a, and then there's the idea that it, once it gets out, that something happened to somebody and people's going, ah, you know, um, then you get a self-fulfilling prophecy. Any way you slice it, I think that um, it's a real thing. Yeah. Well, and to add to the mystery and the controversy, many archaeologists believe that the boy king died really unexpectedly. He possibly in a, um, in a chariot accident, injuries sustained in a chariot accident. So um, he had uh, an unusual thing happen to his mummy that also hasn't totally been explained. It, uh, it caught fire mysteriously after his body was mummified and the tomb was, was sealed. And since reopening the tomb in 1922, experts have studied the, the mummy and kind of the spontaneous mummy combustion. And the fun thing is they don't really know they think maybe there was enough uh, flammable embalming oils, like the wick of a candle, similar to how we talked about spontaneous combustion, that reacted with what little air was in those chambers uh, or in the tomb itself. And it started a chain reaction, which cooked the uh, corpse. And some people think because of the, the sudden death and therefore sudden burial that they botched the embalming job essentially which is um one explanation that's the closest scientific one that you can come up with but there are plenty of other anecdotal uh, theories as to why king tut was you know a, a human torch after the uh long after his his death so there's yeah, a lot you of know, fun mystery on that one. Well, you know, people people are, including me, are fascinated with everything Egyptian. Uh, I was always fascinated with pyramids from the time I was a kid. I think people uh, have seen lots of depictions of Egyptian life, you know, um, the whole Bible story in the Old Testament. But even beyond that, it's it's just an incredible culture. Yeah, and and reflects, I think, certain uh, archetypal truths that that make us wonder, that, you know, that that capture our imagination. You know, when you start going down the rabbit hole on this boy Pharaoh, who knows? Maybe he was killed. Maybe it was a political thing. You know, they resented having a boy Pharaoh. He, you know, the power structure at the time doesn't really matter. I guess what. What matters is that we'd like to explain everything scientifically. And it's great that we can't sometimes. <laughs> because right. 
then the, the, the power of our mind, the power of spirit, you know, becomes, um, it opens us to bigger things. Well, how about uh, Cleopatra's tomb? That's another fun one. <laughs> Since, you know, Cleopatra, I guess she was the seventh, the last series of ruler, rule, rulers over the uh, Ptolemies. Uh, you're talking 300 to 30 BC. And they kind of had a, um, a Romeo and Juliet type of uh, relationship to uh, her and Mark Anthony. I thought it was Anthony. just Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, but exactly shows you, how, shows you how old i am you know but they did do a ritual suicide after um a battle that they were defeated in 31 bc um mm -hmm. and they erected this lovely monument near a temple of the egyptian goddess isis but exactly where the tomb is continues to be a mystery um <clears throat> I don't know if they purposely hit it. I don't know if it's been lost in the sands of time, but odds are when they do find it, grave robbers would have found it before. Well, you know, Egyptians were really concerned about death and preparing for death and giving people the things they needed to survive in the afterworld. So it makes sense they would hide this. You know, it makes sense to me that they would hide it. You know. Um, I guess they, you know, regular people, you know, they, they didn't care that much about perhaps, but somebody like Cleopatra, she would have a lot of cool stuff, you know, that she would want to take with her, you know, good, good looking shoes and stuff. <laughs> Probably plenty of sh uh, shoes. Well, how about the infamous, often famous, um, Shroud of Turin. Yeah, I really like that one, actually. I mean, I like all of them. I, I love this kind of stuff. Um, you know, even that uh, there's a TV show called Ancient Aliens, and they, 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 they talk about this stuff, and they go, ancient alien theorists think yes. I don't know yes or no, but I can tell you that, for me, something that, like I said before, something that tweaks your imagination is a good thing. I love that Shroud of Turin thing because, you know, it's a artist depiction of Jesus, something like, you know, I don't know. Um, and I think they, they discovered that it didn't date well, you know, when they analyze a piece of it. Yeah, so there, the, in the literature anyway, there is kind of a, I don't want to know if you want to think of it like a chain of custody, but from where, if it was the original burial shroud around the year zero, um, then it uh, should have dated well to that. But if you follow its migration, uh, and it did have some, you know, traces of blood too, which... I can't remember if they were talking about doing any genetic analysis on that or if that ever happened. I did see a show about that, but the Catholic Church officially recorded the shroud existing in 1353 when it just showed up in a church in France. But remember, the legend goes back at least till 30 AD. So someone either said hey i've got the thing or i know where i can get the thing i don't know who's mm -hmm. going to be disturbing jesus's uh resting place or body but um you know, according to the legend it was transported from what's now palestine to turkey and then later to constantinople and when the crusaders took constantinople in 1204 they moved the cloth to Greece, where it was held until 1225. This goes on and on and on. Well, in 1980s, when kind of the whole carbon dating science came into full force, um, this, is, this was an object that everyone was naturally intrigued to see if it carbon dated um, to the time of Christ, or at least until a time nearby within the error, the sampling error of, of that particular measurement method. 
But unfortunately and controversially, it basically showed that this was a medieval forgery, that the cloth and even the blood on it were probably somewhere between 1260 and 1390. Um, there's been a lot of pushback on that, a lot of religious pushback because people really wanted that to be uh, the true shroud of, of Christ, but um, they tried to say, well, it was stitched together with different pieces and you must be looking at the newer piece. And uh, But most scientists agree that was not actually a bona fide or veridical um, shroud that, that was placed over Jesus' body. It was a forgery that came almost 1,300 years later. But boy, that captivated people's attention. Absolutely. And it does look like the guy. The artist's conception of him. Well, the actual shroud of Turin, you know. Yeah, but I mean, you know, it looks like the guy. What guy looks like me? Right. Well, why is Jesus <laughs> always white is my question. Yeah, he shouldn't be, though. No. If he was a Jew a Jew 2,000 years ago in the Middle East, he's probably had an, an Afro or something, you know? Yeah. He's a, a brown-skinned guy with brown eyes and, and an Afro of some kind. Hey, do you know about the Copper Scroll treasures? No. Did you find one in the office? I did. It's worth millions <laughs> of dollars. No, it kind of reminds me of, like, the Rosetta Stone. Um, oh, matter yeah. Matter of fact, we talked about putting the Rosetta Stone on here, because to me, that's very fascinating in and of itself um but this one's similar that this ancient copper scroll which was discovered in 1952 was basically describing a massive amount of hidden gold and silver so it's kind of mm -hmm. like a treasure map you know but 1952 everyone started looking for this thing it the reason why it was so significant is it was found alongside the dead sea scrolls uh oh, so in the west is... bank in the west bank in the palestinian territories uh easily dates back 2000 years um when the romans were controlling that particular settlement Qumran. and they think that it might be a description you know, almost like the old MapQuest descriptions of how to find this uh, immense deposit of, of gold and silver um, in order to keep the locals out and uh, <clears throat> the Russian forces um, from looting it. I'm sorry, the Roman, not the Russian. But nobody's ever found the treasure. So it's either been grave robbed, not adequately searched for, or this thing in and of itself was sort of a, a hoax. Or they just didn't interpret it correctly. Or they didn't interpret. So maybe we, maybe we ought to go look for that one. It's okay with me. I'll get my metal detector. I like that stuff. How about the how about the Voynich manor, manuscript? Have you heard of this? Seen this? Oh heard yeah, about this? yeah. That's a two hundred and fifty page book, right? Yeah, that's impressive. It was uh, one of the most talked about books of the twentieth century, um, and it was an ancient text, and literally no one could read it, so it was very puzzling because there are some dead languages, whether that's Latin or or Aramaic or um, Babylonian, Sumerian. There are, there's ancient uh, manuscripts that are written in obscure, you know, obscure languages, some of which we know of, or we maybe have not totally deciphered. This one just threw us for a loop because for 250 pages, they can't find a cipher in this book. They, they can't even put together the alphabet. Uh, matter of fact, most of it is illustrations, almost like it was a Chinese or, or, a, or visual language based. Um, but it also had lots of pictures of um, 
zodiac signs, medicinal herbs, sometimes female forms. I think it's at Yale currently housed in the uh, rare manuscript library. And they think it was probably written in Central Europe. Um, a lot of people think it's a hoax. But because of the intelligible, unintelligible word, words, but what I find, uh, I guess, the most fascinating about it is that so many people are convinced this book was written in code, that there is a cipher, and that there is a way to interpret its meaning. Seems and, like a lot of pages for a hoax. Yeah, and boy, have they tried. Um, there's one group, I think, in University of Bedfordshire in English, and they claim to have deciphered, I think, 14 of the uh, characters in way back into 2014. So they think it's a treatise on nature. It's written near Eastern or the closest languages would be um, Asian, like we were talking about, visual uh, symbolic languages like Chinese or Japanese. But it's just fascinating that it does look so detailed, so comprehensive, and so completely <clears throat> elusive. That's why it remains on our list of some crazy stuff. Well, it's, it's you know, it's ancient and it's unintelligible. And how could we resist? <laughs> well, here's a fun one that you won't be able to resist. Okay. Talk about the hobbits. You see, I didn't know that was a real thing. I thought it was it was just a book. Well, some scientific discoveries are truly stranger than fiction. Um, because in 2003, they found these little guys on a remote Indonesian island off of uh, Flores. And what they found was an ancient uh, hominin, Homo floresensis, which is different from Homo sapiens, our species. Uh, and it was a cute little guy that quickly got dubbed the Hobbit. Um, they're about three and a half feet tall. They think the, the uh, one specimen that they found was about a 30-year-old adult female. Um, and they thought, uh, oh, no, these are human bones, but they must have had some sort of a genetic um, you know, mutation that caused this little creature to only grow to three and a half foot tall despite 30 years of bone growth. Um, but later discoveries showed that it's not a tiny human, it's its own species. And it was definitively proven that very new but expected uh, hominin that should have fit on our family tree. It had just yet wow. to be discovered. But they, they didn't call themselves hobbits. We transferred over the name. No, I think we just like the name Hobbit. Okay, I like it. I actually like it. Because it's got hobo in it. And it's, I like hobo. Hobo's good. Here's another, here's another mystery. I think everyone's heard of this one. Noah's Ark. Has anyone heard of, have you heard of Noah? Noah? Noah's Ark. Man, you know, they, didn't they have like a whole bunch of shows, or, you know, that it was over in um, Iraq or Turkey or something and, and they had found, you know, the, found the boat. I guess it would be more than a boat to have that many animals on it, but. Um, well, they looked in Turkey because in the Bible, I believe that's where it, around Mount Ara, Ararat. Mm -hmm. That's where the boat supposedly came to rest uh, in the book of Genesis, a, but. Probably be a ship by then, huh? You know, some, some researchers doubt whether it was ever built. Um, some think that it was built, we just haven't found it. Uh, and it might not be where they're mm -hmm. looking, but it has been found so many times that every time someone's like, oh, I found Noah's Ark. It's almost like the boy who cried wolf. They're like, yeah. We've heard that before. Well, we would, we would like to believe that we found it, I, you know. 
I mean, every, you know, we, we deal with metaphysical events and we want anything that helps us to believe what we've invested in. You know, um, as they said in Star Trek, you know, Captain Pike has his imagination or whether they're saying you have your reality, Captain Kirk, and may yours yeah. be as pleasant. Um, you know, where as we start going down the rabbit hole of consciousness, we'll find that, you know, there's a lot more to consciousness than just, you know, what we say matter is. And like, that's an upcoming episode, I guess. But um, of oh, our Oh, yeah, we're working podcast, on that one already. You know, the bottom line is, okay, you can take things metaphorically. They mean something or archetypally. You know, we, we both studied Carl Jung. Um, anything that explains or gives us ideas about our consciousness is worth engaging. And, you know, Noah's Ark is a classic story. It's in not just in, in our Bible, but it's in the basic story is in many different uh, mm -hmm. ancient cultures, the story of a flood and the redemption from, from the flood. Now, the idea that maybe, maybe we could find, we could find Noah's Ark, I don't know. Would it, would it have painted on this side Noah in English? I don't know how we would, how we would identify it. Well, hopefully by the original uh, specs or designs, you know, I think a lot of that was in the Bible where they actually talked about the size of it. It was cubits, not feet, right? Do yeah. Do we know how much a cubit is? Do we know, how much? I don't know. Yeah, you just Google it, man. Oh, okay. I like that better. Here's one of my favorite, the lost city of Maya. The Mayan lost city. Where did they go? Well, that Why? is a that's a pretty good question. You know, they do have the artifacts there. They, they left where the tons people. of them behind. And you know, that's that's not just confined to them. You know, the Anasazi, the same thing, and you know, in the <laughs> southwestern United States, where do these people? Many go? of them disappeared very quickly. Um, but I think the the Mayans fascinate me because. They, they were thriving, they were well known in central, pretty much all in the Americas. But some people argue they even came down from North America, that's a different theory, you know, 10,000 years prior. But they clearly ruled for at least six centuries, the Southern uh, Mexico and kind of North Central America. And they've been trying to solve these clues for decades, but for some reason around 900 AD, um, possibly a drought may have played a key role in the fall of it, but Maya's clearing forests, trying to make way for bigger cities and farmlands. It's kind of like a micro deforestation theory. And they might've inadvertently, inadvertently worsened the, their, the frequency and the severity of their own droughts essentially drying them up which i think that's romantic because that's a good metaphor of what we're doing yeah you know, no globally. kidding globally um but i don't know it feels too emotional to me i i think it's more likely that there was a problem with the soil de uh, degradation possibly declining prey populations they were you know hunters of fish and white-tailed deer and all kinds of things like that um, shifting trade routes would have made, you know, trading more difficult. Um, of course, they also had their own internal political conflicts, um, which has caused a downfall of, of, of many great empires on the past. So why would the Mayans be any different? But it's just unusual to see them do so well for so long and disappear so suddenly without really an explanation as to why yeah no note didn't find any note we're leaving by. they didn't leave a note that was inconsiderate we left because conditions got weird no i don't i don't have that accent quite right 
Spanish is a little rusty. It's actually, you know, I, w- I was down down there um, a couple of years ago, and there's a lot of really unexplained mystical stuff. We talked about Chichen Itza last time. And when I was at Ek Balam, uh, which they only had excavated 20 years ago, um, the stuff there looked, looked outer space. I mean, our tour guide, you know, basically said, you know, this isn't from our planet. And he said, I'm not supposed to say, he says, I'm not supposed to say this, you know, goes against the narrative, but he knew he was talking to me. So he said, he goes, look at this stuff. This doesn't look like it's from here. Wow. And, and Ekbalam itself means sky jaguar. So go figure. Well, it, think of the mystery of Kat Shibib. Everyone knows that one. No, it's it's similar to Nazca Line slash um, Great Wall of China. For some reason, in the Middle East, um, and again, it wasn't really discovered until airplanes started flying over in the 20s and 30s. I don't think the wall was really investigated until the 1940s, but this thing's almost 100 miles long. It was built out of stone. It should have had an obvious purpose but it was a very short wall. It was just over three feet. So not meant to keep people out or even animals in. And why would it only be one side? It's very unexplained as to who built it, number one, um, because it's in Jordan and there were a lot of different people occupying that era, you know, that area over different times. And what the heck is the function of it? Well, that's Some, the that's the ultimate issue, isn't it? I yeah. Mean, what, if you're looking at the these things, from, well, well, I mean, what's the function of it? But as you're flying over it, you can see that it it's aligning aligning certain landmarks, um, or in the case of the Nazca lines, you know, certain deities, perhaps. Um, it becomes more more interesting. Well, and it's not perfectly straight everywhere. There are sections where the wall will branch off. I mean, from the regular line, um, Mm -hmm. some areas there'll be two parallel walls that will run Mm -hmm. side by side for a period of time. So it's very peculiar. You could suggest, hey, well, they're just trying to keep these hungry goats out. Well. Except it wouldn't work. Yeah, goats can jump big pretty enough. high, or they could go around. Uh, it's to me that's not. Um, I a just find explanation. I find stuff that you can't see unless you're in an airplane from a culture that doesn't supposed to have isn't supposed to have airplanes. Mm-hmm. It's pretty amazing. That's always going to be amazing to me. Well, then you're going to be amazed by the big circles because those are similar to other uh, ground-based mysteries. They're only seen from the sky. And it's amazing that these stone circles, which date back at least 2,000 years again, they're dotting the Jordanian countryside and scientists have no clue what they're for they call them just the big circles um about 11 of these structures have been spotted so far and they're big they're you know they're they're a quarter of a mile in uh, diameter so some are uh, have a little bit of elevation a few feet high uh, really short walled circles but it's unlikely they were livestock corrals according to archaeologists because there there were so many livestock style corrals that these matched none of them. This was like a totally different um, purpose. And they've got no clue what these things were built for. They're trying to compare it to similar circles that were found in the Middle East uh, to see if they could get more of an idea of what in the world these things were or are i don't i don't know i mean i just love that they exist 
We have time for three more. Let's go for it. Um, here's one called the Cocono Stone. And in 2016 in Scotland, um, archaeologists excavated a 5,000 year old stone slab. And this so called Cocono Stone was pretty darn big. It was about 45 by 25 feet. Mm. Uh, and in the stone, what was interesting is there was swirling patterns that they call cup and ring marks, but they've also been identified at prehistoric sites in other parts of the world. So once again, you're seeing similar markings in other parts of the world at other times mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that shouldn't, shouldn't have the knowledge of each other, but the slab could be an example of an ancient work or it could have had a much more daily fundamental purpose, um, like as an astronomical tool. And that these inscriptions are going to help predict things like eclipses, um, solar lunar events. But they really have no clue on this one either. It's definitely man-made, it's definitely ornate it's definitely old it definitely appears to have you know a, a, a intelligent purpose behind it but they got nothing we seem, be, we seem to be running into a pattern here that's why they're unexplained unexplained hey were you when you were at stonehenge did you see superhenge no I don't know why they wouldn't show you Superhenge. It's less than two miles away from Stonehenge. Not only did they not show me it, no one mentioned that it existed. Oh, well, then maybe I, mean, I, I learned about Superhenge from you. How's that? So Superhenge is, is kind of a um, part two of Stonehenge, I think, um, because similar to Stonehenge, less than two miles away in the UK, this huge monument looks like uh, what a giant would do if he, if he wanted to play dominoes with himself. You know, he would just pick up these 30, 60, 90 ton boulders, mm -hmm. stand them all upright, you know, just far enough so that one could fall into the next, could fall into the next. And um, these monoliths basically um, don't really lead anywhere. They don't seem to align anywhere. They thought maybe it was some sort of a sundial. Some of the slabs have been pushed over almost 5,000 years ago now. Wow. <clears throat> Was there a certain configuration like Stonehenge? Was it a circle? Well, there was a C shape to it, which made some of the archaeologists suggest that this could have been an, a type of an arena, you know, whether that's for performances or, or, or you know, gladiators fighting, uh, bullfighting, who knows. But some event, I don't think that they were probably doing Shakespeare. <laughs> but it, but they did describe it as an arena, which it had springs and a valley that led down to the river. So that, that's ostensibly possible. I just find it interesting that uh, it was so close to Stonehenge and we're still trying to figure out how they got all these huge monoliths all the way from the quarry miles and miles and miles away to, to assemble Stonehenge in the first place. Well, they also had this super. These were the. Do you know if if the boulders were bigger than Stonehenge? I think they're about the same size, actually. Because I I was at Stonehenge. Those were big things, man. I... Oh yeah, monoliths. Um, yeah, some of these are about fifteen foot tall, depending on how far they've sunk into the ground, but. That's another fun mystery. We would need to lift them with cranes and set them on flatbed trucks and then haul them back to the quarry to show how much work they right. did by hand. 
And it would be an undertaking for us modern humans to do that. Were you ready for the last, but certainly not least? Can you take the suspense? Bring it on. Bring it on, brother. Bring it on. All right, I'm bringing. There is a land that is no longer above land. It's um, called Underwater Karen. C-A-I-R-N. Where does and, it uh, exist? Huh? Where is it near? So it's in Israel near beneath the Sea of Galilee. So wow. real interesting ancient part of the world. In 2003, this was discovered. Now it's an enormous monument. It's made up of many giant stones placed on top of one another. Um, you know, weighs at least 60,000 tons. Wow. Uh, off the ocean floor and rises nearly, I think, 32 feet high. Hmm. It's all completely underwater. So the scientists who found this, they thought, oh, this is like an underwater rock pile. Uh, they had no idea mm -hmm. what it might have been used for. But they thought, oh, well, it's one of these cairns and other mm -hmm. parts of the world. Those are to mark ritual uh, burials and things like that. So they figured this was an underwater graveyard that was once above water and then through the sands of times is now buried in the Sea of Galilee. Through rising wow. sea levels. You know, like there's a like that town in uh uh well, one of our states here that completely was buried when they um rerouted the dam might have been the colorado river the cairn huh yeah it's thought to be about four thousand years old um probably a settlement of some type type although based on its construction and the fact that these materials have been underwater and have lasted this long it was probably a fortified settlement um whether that was a place of war, a place of defense, or just a secure place for royalty. But it is completely uh, and amazingly intact underwater. Mm, wow. And it's a mystery. It's a mystery. Who built it? Who put it there? The human mind is a mystery. What were these people thinking? If we knew, we wouldn't have the show. That's true. But I think it sets us up um, pretty much for next week because one of the things um, we were going to talk about is how consciousness can heal consciousness can connect to other consciousness consciousness can um navigate often navigate around the constructs of time you might be able to hear an echo of an event that occurred in the past if there even is such a thing as as time or a linearity of time these are the big questions we're going to be talking about we've got big questions and we're going to try to come up with big answers um so we're going to need well, some big luck well we we've been uh working on ourselves for a long time one of the uh blessings and occupational hazards of this profession is you have to keep working on yourself we want things to make sense we want our lives to make sense, but even in a bigger way, we want our existence to have meaning. Okay, so now we've listed 20, I think 20 archaeological. Excuse me, 23? Yeah, we did three for bonus there at the end. Ah, three bonus ones. So 23 events that we can't explain. Okay, so our our 
official narrative is limited at best and just, you know, a bill of goods at worst. Maybe you'll be the one, not just you, but somebody out there will be the one to put the puzzle together, give our life meaning or more meaning. Make well, I think the sense. meanings, the meanings there, we just have to discover it and uncover it in ourselves. Yeah, but I think the pattern is is about a bigger meaning. These cultures all put these things there and they had their reason for whatever it was, or even leaving, they had a reason. We put them all together, we'll have a better understanding of our world. And perhaps with that understanding, we can have a less warlike place, a, a less conflict. Well, I've been doing a, a lot of research on, on next week's show, and um, I'm pretty excited. I think there's a lot of concepts that we've been close to connecting that I think are gonna be tying a lot of this together. So make sure you're here next week. Wait, what? I, I'm being told I might have to be out of town next week, but. Oh no. Next time then. Next time, that's more accurate. Yeah, and uh, as always, you know, make sure in the meantime, you continue to. Be well. Well. Oh, wait, I forgot to count. One, two, three, four. Be well. Be well. How do I stop the recording?